John chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. In John 9, Jesus and his disciples are walking along a path. Verse 1 says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither, Jesus replied, this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again as you've been taking us along in this series that you are willing to challenge us some more. May we see at the end. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Very theological question. They're walking along the path. They see a blind man with his cardboard sign saying, help, blind from birth, need food. And the disciples in this moment want to be able to justify this person's predicament. Have you ever been there where you want to find a reason why that person is unhoused? You want to find a reason why this person is uh, down on their luck so that you don't have to feel responsible in any kind of way. You may not even need compassion because they're basically getting what they deserve. The disciples have this kind of uh, callous uh, reaction, it seems. Lord, why is this man in such a dire situation? Is it because of his sin? Or his parents sin. Now, he was blind from birth, so what they're asking is really, did God foreknow that, they, that this man would be a sinner and he was punishing him uh, uh, from the beginning? This is what they believed. This was their theology. Because in their, in their religious system, nothing bad could happen for no reason at all. If someone is, 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 is financially strapped it is because they have not been paying their tithe faithfully or contributing to the local budget or took part in the fundraising for the renovation of the restrooms. That's the reason why you've been from check to check, week to week. This is what we were raised to believe. I've said this before, my mom used to <laughs> share this with us, very common uh, of, of um, adage she said she said that the lord don't bless ugly the lord don't bless ugly so if you're experiencing ugly in your life there's something you must you must have done and and we and we have scriptural evidence for this because the bible says we will reap what we have sown right so god is god 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 cannot be mocked he is just so if you're going through what you're going through it's because you deserve it so why? But Jesus says something that kind of throws this whole thing off. He says it's not because of this man's uh, future sins or current sins, and it's not because his parents sinned. The reason he's born blind is so that God's works might be displayed in him. Now that, that, that bothers me a little bit. <laughs> this makes me think of, of Job. Right? Job going through what he's going through, a righteous man, not because he sinned, but because God got into a disagreement with Lucifer. You know the story very well. In Job chapter 1, it says that all the sons of God came together, and Lucifer was among them. And he asked Lucifer, oh, oh, where you've been? Now, it is believed these sons that come to God are from all the other planets that, that, that God had created. That's, that's the belief. because They don't believe it's human beings that have come before God. That, that these, are, these are his representatives from all the other planets. So Adam should have been there, but because Adam turned the keys over to Satan, voted for a new presidency, it is now Satan who is the prince and ruler of this world, according to Jesus. So Satan is representing planet Earth at this point. And so, so, so God asks him, where you been? He's like, man, to and fro, <laughs> to and fro. That sounded cool back then, to and fro. 
just walking, up, walking along the earth, doing my thing. He's like, hey, have you, have you noticed my servant Job? Is there anyone more righteous than him? Lucifer's like, oh, man, he's only righteous because you bless him. You have a protective hedge around him. If you were to allow me to get my hands on him, he would curse you to your face. So God says, oh, wager on. I will allow you to touch Job, but not his body, but everything else you can harm, but not his body, and let's see what happens. The Bible tells us that in a matter of seconds, this man who God says is righteous, is good, finds out in a matter of seconds, I'm t I mean, if you just read it, it, it only takes you 15 seconds to get through it, a messenger comes and says, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we lost everything in the stock market. Another servant, before he finishes, says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. All of the farmland, all of the crops, everything has been scorched by the sun. Fire came out of heaven. I'm so sorry. Before he finishes, someone says, your children, they were, they were fellowshipping at, the, at a home and and a strong wind just blew the home and it collapsed on them and all of your kids are dead. He hears this. How many of us would just pass out hearing that much evil has come to our doorstep? What does the Bible say? Job does. And many people believe this is just an allegory. They, they don't believe this could actually have happened in real life because it just sounds so extraordinary. What is Job's response? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. May his name be praised. Oh, we all just look at Job. There's my man. Golf clap. Look at Job. Wow. How could someone have that amount of faith in the face of that much tragedy. So Lucifer shows up at the next board meeting, and God says, ah, you saw my boy. You saw how he was still down for me? Lucifer's like, oh, that's only because you didn't allow me to touch him. Anybody will say anything to spare their own life. If I could get my hands on his physical body, he would for sure curse you to your face. He says, all right, all right, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. Ho, ho, ho. So it's exactly what Lucifer does. He touches his body and, and painful pus oozing sores break out all over his body. And what does Job do? His wife comes up to comfort him, but she just, she's angry. She's angry. She's also grieving the loss of her children. She realizes that they will never be able to make the mortgage payment. She realizes everything has collapsed in, their, in her life, and she sees her husband in such pain and suffering, and she feels so powerless. So she says, just curse God and die. I can't believe he would do this to us. Curse him and die. And Job says, we... Praise God in the good times. We have to still praise him in the bad times. And in chapter 2, it says that in everything Job did, he did not curse God. We are encouraged by Job's reaction to this kind of pain and suffering. Things that he's going through that appear absolutely pointless. But you'll say to me, but, but, but he was glorifying God. God was making a point. And I'm going to tell you something, family. Not everything we go through is about us. This is the first point of this message I want you to get. Not everything we go through is about us. It's not because of our sins, our parents' sins. It's not because we put ourselves in a bad situation. Some stuff we go through, believe it or not, is for others. Sometimes it is going to be about the glory of God. And we'll unpack that a little bit more as we go along. But not everything you're going through is just about you. And clearly in the story of Job, it doesn't appear to be about him. It appears to be about an argument that Jesus is having with Lucifer.
So his response is very commendable. Most preachers will use this to encourage us how to respond in times of suffering. Here's my only problem with this story. If we were to end it after chapter 2, I could pat Job on the back and say, you the man. The problem is, the book of Job is 42 chapters long. Most people stop preaching it after chapter 2. By chapter 3, the very next chapter, Job loses his stuff. And he begins to curse. Oh, he didn't curse God, but he cursed everywhere around him. He began to, he cursed the day he was born. He cursed the day it was said that a boy is, is, is born. He, he cursed, he wished that dark clouds would cover that day. He wishes he had never lived. His friends come to comfort him. The Bible says they spend seven days in silence just grieving with Job. People always want to talk about Job's friends as being mean. None of us have spent seven days in complete silence to show connection and empathy with people that have been suffering in our lives. We'll send a text, praying for you, girl. But can you imagine going on a technology ban for seven days, just seven days? I'm not touching my phone. I, I got somebody to watch the kids. Listen, I'm going to sit in this pit with you for seven days. Do not, do not disparage the friends of Job. They're being real friends at this point. Well, what goes wrong? Why do they turn on Job? Why do they, be, why do they become so upset? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Go to, go to Job chapter 7. We're going we're to run through this really quickly. Let's go through Job chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Job chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. This is what Job says. Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. The eye that now sees me will no longer. You will look for me, but I will be no more. Verse 11. Therefore, I will not keep silent. I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Verse 17 through 21. What is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment? Will you never look away from me or let me alone even for an instant? If I have sinned, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do, why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. Chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. How then can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him, speaking of God? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I summoned him and he responded, this is a court scene, meaning that I called him to court so that we could settle our disputes. Even if I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me catch my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. Chapter 10, verses 3 through 7. Does it please you to oppress me? to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as humans see? Are your days like those of a mortal man? Are your years like those of a strong man that you must search out my faults and probe after my sin, though you know that I am not guilty and that no one can rescue me from your hand? Chapter 10, this will be the last one I'll, I'll read. I, look at there's 42 chapters to this. <laughs> Verses 8 through 18, your hands shaped me and they made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you, did you not pour me out like milk and curdle like me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life and showed me kindness and in your providence watched over my spirit. 
but this is what you concealed in your heart. And, and I know that this was in your mind. If I sinned, you would be watching me and would not let my fe- offense go unpunished, right? The Lord don't bless ugly. If I am guilty, woe to me. Even if I am innocent, I cannot lift my head, for I am full of shame and drowned in my affliction. If I hold my head high, you stalk me like a lion and again display your awesome power against me. Who did Jesus say roams around like a lion waiting to seek and devour? He said it was Satan. Job says, no, it's you. You are the lion. He says, you bring new witnesses against me and increase your anger toward me. Your forces come against me wave upon wave. Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before an eye saw me. That's Job. The one we're supposed to emulate How many can feel him? This is scripture. It is believed it is the very first book written in the Bible. And the very first book written in the Bible deals with the very modern issues we have with God today. Why? My daughter who's been in our home since she was 16, said to me often that she didn't believe in God because she couldn't believe he would allow her to be born into the predicament she was born into. In the foster care system, all of her childhood, because of things that happened to her when she was a baby. And she said, God, just stood back and watched. Many can't sit in a church because of this kind of anger, because of this kind of circumstance. How can you tell me God loves me and yet he remains silent and can do nothing? Seemingly, the one who loves me, who would give his life for me, but he can't even give me a handout in the circumstance I'm in right now. Some of you who have been struggling with chronic pain for years, and you can say, I was faithful in my church attendance. I I, I have given my life in service. I, I, I I have been a good steward in the church. And all I'm asking for, God, is just relief. The man who had been born blind We don't know how many years, most likely he's in his early 20s at this time. He also is wondering why God does not like him. What did he do to deserve this? He was a baby. He couldn't have sinned, right? So why, Lord, why does this happen? Why so much suffering and why so much pain? We were challenged last week to deal with living in the, in the tension of no, not getting our prayers answered. Well, this is tension, real tension. All right, I'm going to cut the tension just a little bit. You need a little bit of a break. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's heavy. I know. It's bringing up stuff. Some of you are already tearing up. Some of you are feeling your, your heart pounding because you're angry and you're frustrated. Some of you are shocked that Job had not been struck by lightning yet. You didn't know you could get away with saying this kind of stuff to God, did you? I read this in college for the very first time, and I was like, there is no way there's another chapter <laughs> after chapter 10. There, there is, and there, someone else must have just, there's no way Job got away with this. But the more I read, the more I became emboldened. And I was like, oh, oh, it's on. It's on. Yeah, what are you going to say to that, God? I wish you would, right? No. So watch, watch. So when I was in high school, I, 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 I became employed for the very first time. A real job, real check. I, I started working for a company that I admired growing up and loved being there, and it involved a rodent. It was maybe the happiest place on earth if you couldn't afford to really go to the happiest place on earth. It was Chuck E. Cheese. 
Mm. Love Chuck E. Cheese. That's right. So I started working there. I had, a, I had a, a friend who worked there, and he helped me get in. They loved him as an employee, and they said, we just, we want to employ friends of really good employees because we believe you're of the same ilk. And I'm like, that's right, I'm of the same ilk. So I was working in the game room with a bunch of video games, which is like, this is my forte if you know me. I was helping kids all the time. They'd come up to me and go, Mister, the, the, the game ate my tokens. Oh, the game ate your tokens. Let me come and help you out. So I would open it up with my keys and I would give them another token. I was good at this for the first two hours. <laughs> but when you're working a whole shift, eight hours, having kids, Mister, Mister, it didn't give me my tickets, Mister, the tokens were eaten by, no, the, the game can't eat your tokens, kid. So my employers recognized that I probably wasn't best suited with dealing with people. If they could only see me now. So they wanted me to no longer work in the game room because they didn't think I smiled enough, I was warm enough, and really the introvert in me would come out after a few hours on the floor. So, so they said, we're going to move you to the kitchen. I said, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the kitchen, right? They said, but while we're training you for the kitchen, you're going to have a, a week or two where we still want you to work, uh, we're going to be training you, but we're going to have you uh, in costume. So for a couple of weeks, I was Chuck E. Cheese. Now you have to understand that it is typically their policy to have people in costume that are of a shorter stature. Because once you start putting on those big heads, you look taller. And so at that time, I was like 5'9", which, you know, I'm in high school. It felt tall enough. But when I put on Chuck's big head, I was scary. I would scare parents. They would walk into Chuck E. Cheese, and then they'd go, oh, oh. <laughs> they were looking up to Chuck, and they weren't used to that. So, oh, but the kids, they were so precious. Do you know the things they would tell me? The secrets, Chuck E. Chuck e. Cheese? I said, well, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't talk. And I had very bad visibility. All I could see is out of the mouth. And I would just listen to them, and I couldn't say anything, but I was their friend. But one day, I was doing a birthday party, two birthday parties to be exact. And I was singing and dancing. I will not do it up here. It's not appropriate, but... I had some moves as Chuck E. Cheese. I was doing my song and dance with one party, and then I had to run over to the other party and then do a little song and dance, and it was going on, and the animatronics thing were doing their weird things. Those things were kind of scary. You remember the old animatronics at Chuck E. Cheese? Ooh. So they were doing their thing, the music was going on, and I am, I'm gigging over here, and I go over to the other party, and I'm gigging over there. Well, one kid in my routine wanted to give me a hug. It's a birthday boy just overwhelmed with joy that Chucky was at his birthday party. And because I couldn't see him very well, he comes running up to me. I didn't see him, but I felt him. I looked through the mouth and I could see a kid in slow motion going, Chucky no! as he flies across the room. Oh, everybody stopped the celebration. The music had to cut. The family just surrounded him. And here I was wanting to just take off the mask and do CPR. And I mean, I mean, really tend to the kid. But I couldn't. I had to stay in character and I had to stay silent. I'm leaning over, touching the kid. And the parents are like, we got it. We got it, Chucky. Thank you. We understand. No, we know it's an accident. It's okay. It's okay. And I got up and I just walked away. The pressure of being Chuck E. Cheese and not letting kids down literally is a real thing, right? Wanting to be kids' best friends, wanting to be there for me. And it's interesting that when we look at the narrative of Scripture, 
and we see God, it often feels like these kind of moments where we go, oh God, you're so wonderful. I just want to hug you. I heard about how much you love me. And then we get kicked across a room. And when we want to hear God's voice, it's like he doesn't even have a tongue. He can't even speak to us. In our pain and suffering, Job goes on for chapters and chapters, and God is silent. So we'll go back to John 9. Jesus says it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins, but so that God's works might be displayed in him. After saying this in John 9, verse 6 and 7, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes, and then told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The word means sent. Um, for our centennial, actual centennial uh, day anniversary worship experience, I, I talked about a similar situation where Jesus spit in a man's eyes uh, in order to give him back his sight. This is a little bit different. Uh, Jesus is making um, a mud mask, so to speak. Uh, man can't see what Jesus is doing, clearly, because he's blind, but the man can hear it. And in order for Jesus to make mud out of dirt, this is not a dainty little <laughs> This is of the variety of, and if you have a queasy stomach, just close your ears. This is the <laughs> And he hears it. <laughs> and it's just oozing. And the man's like, probably like, I, I just want money. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, sir. I just want money. Can you just help? Jesus, <laughs> And he's making just mud. And then he takes it, just oozing through his fingers, and then starts placing it on the man's face. The man can't see it, but he can feel it. And then after making the situation worse, which I'm telling you in Scripture, it does seem like God, before things get better, sometimes makes it worse, right? He, he, he leads the, the Hebrews out of Egypt, and now they're trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. They were in a worse predicament at this point. Often things look worse before they get better, but God seemingly has a purpose here. And after doing this, he tells the man to go wash his face. Now, I think if you put mud on someone's face, the least you could do is wash it, right? You would think, right? Don't worry, you won't get struck down. Job didn't get struck down. You can say it. But the man is asked by Jesus to go wash his face. And so in John 9, the last part of uh, verse 7, so the man went and washed and came home. Oh, man, this is good stuff. This is the wonderful part. Again, this is, this is the man taking part in his healing. This is him participating with Jesus. Jesus didn't do it alone. And we talked about that. God is never asking to do it all by himself. He's always wanting to partner with us when it comes to prayer. He partners with us when it comes to faith. This man was able to participate in his healing. We are also asked to participate. Even when we're praying, it doesn't mean that prayer cancels out therapy. Are you listening? You can pray and go to therapy. Amen? Right? So we can do our part, and God will surely do his part. The same reason why he told Lazarus uh, at, at Lazarus's tomb, he told everybody to move the stone away first. Then he brought Lazarus back from the, from the dead, and then told the people to untie him and let him go. Prayer is just part of the ingredients that produce the results that we want. And so the man, he goes, and he washes his face, and he comes back seen. This is the part where all of us want to rejoice, but it is difficult in the muddy situations, is it not? The man comes home seen. The Bible says as we continue on and later on in chapter 9 that the people that saw the man were like, how in the world could you see? He says, hey man, this, this guy named Jesus, you know, he saw my sign and I... <laughs> They were like, oh, there's no way. Is this, is this man a good man? And they found out that this healing happened on the Sabbath. So they were determined to, to cancel Jesus. This could not be a good person. This could not be a good person. And so they began to argue with him. 
This man can't be a good man who healed you. He must be possessed by a demon. And, 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 and this argument is so interesting because when we don't think that God is good all the time, we begin to doubt the times when we believed he was good, right? This happens all the time when someone gets canceled. Someone will find a, a tweet from like 40 years ago. Okay, not 40. I, I'm exaggerating, clearly. You know, I, I, from like 10 years ago, and they see that this person said something that was disparaging uh, to, to, to a, a, a protected group or a marginalized group, and, and then they go, oh, we, can't, well, we should never watch this person's show again. This person should never act again. This person should never be up in front of people again, right? Because you, we can't deal with that dichotomy that, that sometimes they may be good and sometimes they may be bad. So Job is arguing with God in his story. God, you can't be who you say you are. There's no way. You blind the judges. You laugh when innocent people die. I didn't even read that part. But that's what he says. You laugh when innocent people die. So he struggles with this tension, and we do too. We struggle it within our relationships, our loved ones, spouses, parents. How can you be good in one moment and bad in another moment? It's difficult. And so this tension is going on. How can this man be good? And so finally the blind man says something that I think is absolutely so profound. Chapter 9, verses 24 through 25. It says, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. You couldn't have been blind. We know this man is a sinner, the one who healed you. We know he's a sinner. And he finally replies, says, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not no. This was a scene. His parents had been brought in. They asked, is this your son? They said, yes. Was he born blind? They said, yes. Well, is the one who healed him a sinner? We don't know. Ask him. And he stops it. I don't know. I don't know if he was a good man. I don't know what he did in his past. I don't know if he was a good carpenter. I don't know anything. All I know is this. I once was blind. But now, I see. And this is all I can settle on right now. I once was blind, but now I see. And for some reason, arriving at this place seemed to make everything well with his soul. I wonder what happens with Job. The Bible does say in chapter 38 of Job that God finally speaks to him out of a whirlwind. He speaks to Job. It starts off a little bit insensitive. God seems to be flexing a little bit his divinity. He asks Job, uh, you've been asking a lot of questions. Now I want you to ask, I'm going to ask you some questions I want you to answer. Now God never answers any of Job's questions directly, which initially I was a little offended by. I'm like, at least, at least on some of these questions you should answer. All God does is ask more questions. Were you there, Job? Were you there when I made the world? Do you know how big it is? Did you, did you extend a measuring? A measurement across to know how big it is? Have you ever walked on the floor of the ocean? Do you know who binds Pallades and, and the stars? Do, do, you, do you know all these? He goes, oh, oh you, you must know because you were there from the beginning, right, Job? I mean, God's even being divinely sarcastic. It sounds so insensitive. He starts asking him about hippos and, and, and ostriches and ants and, and, and the Leviathan, which is some God -like, Godzilla-like creature. I mean, all these things. And Job can't answer any of the questions. And I'm telling you, when we challenge God in these times of heartache and suffering, we do want answers. But I have learned something that I hope you get. These answers never will make it better. Why is suffering happen? Why did this happen? Why did the bus crash and 10 people died and five survived? I couldn't stand our mission spotlight stories back in the day in Sabbath school. I'm so sorry for those that I offend. But I couldn't stand those stories where we would talk about a village that burned up, but the, the one village that kept the Sabbath, it, the fire went around it. It taught this belief that if you, if, you, if you trusted in God and you were faithful, he would always be faithful to protect you. But Scripture tells us that prophets were stoned to death. Most of Jesus' disciples, according to Christian history, were crucified. And Christ says, if you follow me, they hated me, they're going to hate you too. 
If you have lived in this world, you are going to suffer. It is the way sin has designed it. And I know you want a reason for why things are happening. Job is asking questions. He wants to know why. The people are questioning this man who was born blind. They want to have all the answers. But I'm telling you something. There's not a reason for everything. I know people want to say that. They feel like it's comforting. It's not. There's a reason why you have cancer right now. There's a reason why your, ch your child died of SIDS. There's a reason. Stop it. There's a reason why you... Stop. There's not a reason for everything. Some things there is a reason. But for most things, there is no reason for it. I'm going to tell you why. Because sin is unreasonable. Sin has always been unreasonable. And this is why Jesus also asked the same questions. Why did you hit me? Oh, you didn't know why? Did you? I'm, I'm asking you, why did you hit me? Why did you come to take me in the middle of the night? I spoke openly in front of you. Why now? Oh, I know why. Because darkness is in control. Sin is unreasonable, and life happens. Junk happens. It's the world that we live in, and that is the reason why Jesus came to save us from this. But he tells us, be of cheer, for I have conquered the world. And Paul says that he'll make us more than conquerors. What Job finally realized is something that we have to come to grips with. Job hears all these questions. He can't answer any of them, any of them, any of them. And he realizes, you know, there's a lot of things I just don't know. A lot of things I would never get. God, you could probably sit down and explain to me all the questions you asked me, and I still wouldn't even understand it. I wouldn't be able to get the answers right on a quiz. There's a lot of things I am struggling with, and I realize I don't know. But based on the questions you've asked me, you do know. And what I have learned in Scripture is that the things that God knows we need to know, he will share them with us. That's why he doesn't call us servants. He calls us friends. For everything my Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. But he does tell his disciples, I have much more to tell you, but you couldn't handle it right now. But when you can, the Holy Spirit will give it to you. When Job finally realizes that God has his eyes on the ants and the hippos, that God makes sure the sun rises and sets, that God is, is, is in the know of every intricate thing happening in the universe, he realizes, God, if you can see the ant, you must see me. If your eye is on the sparrow, then it must be on me. I guess, Lord, what I was really struggling with is... Do you have eyes as flesh? Do you see life? Can you see what we're going through? Can you, does it matter to you? And when Job realizes that not only his life matters to, to God, but all life matters to God. Even the chicken McNuggets matter to God. If his eyes on the sparrow, it's on the chicken as well, right? I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm just telling you, God is so intimately connected to life that the author of Hebrews says that when we fall away, it is like crucifying him anew. Think about that. That when we are suffering, he's suffering with us. There's never a moment that he's not connected with us. That is why by his stripes we are healed. That's why he can be our high priest because he can say, Job, I get it. And I know you think I wouldn't show up at court, but I promise you I will be at court one day and I will be found guilty for you. So Job, after hearing God, wipes away his tears and he says these words. Job 42, verses 2 through 6, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans with, without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you. But now... My eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Job confesses 
that everything he knew about God was something he had heard, but he had never seen him with his own eyes. It was not personal. It was not intimate. It was not authentic. God was bragging about Job's righteousness in heaven, but it was Job's righteousness. And we all know that our righteousness is as filthy rags. God wanted Job to be able to connect on a deeper level. And now Job would not walk around saying, look at how blessed I am. I've been such a good person and God has blessed me. And all you people out there who have not been blessed is because you haven't been good enough. That was Job's theology until now. And Job says, well, we all suffer. The good and the bad, you reign on the just and the un. I didn't know. And you'll suffer too. I didn't know. I just thought life would be fair. I thought that if you did good, good would come. I didn't know that sin is unreasonable. I repent. I see things different, and I see you differently. Faith is most important in these moments that when the world is crashing all around us, we can say these words, it is well with my soul. That we can say, yes, God, great is your faithfulness. We can have moments of vulnerability where we cry out and we struggle and we suffer, but family, don't stop struggling. Don't stop talking to God. Even if you're angry, let him have it. Just don't let go because we'll miss out on these moments when we eye, our eyes see him for the first time. John said, are you really Jesus? Are you really the Messiah? Do you really care? Yes, John. The blind are seeing. That's what he told his disciples. The blind are seeing. And we're not told what John's response is, but I imagine when his disciples said, he's not going to come to visit. John, he didn't say he was going to come to visit, but he wanted you to know that the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the dead are living. But he's not coming to visit you. He's not going to rescue you. We're not told what John says, but I imagine John says, that's my savior. He must increase and I must decrease. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. May his name be praised. And family, one day the mud will be washed away. When you see Jesus come in the clouds of glory, I don't imagine he's going to explain to you why your spouse died so young and you were a widower. I don't think he's going to explain it. I don't think at that moment you'll need an explanation. But when you see the nail marks in his hands, you'll know he was suffering with you and for you. He came to court and he lost. So you and I, could gain. Paul says it this way as the praise team comes forward. Romans 8, 24 through 28, for in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless, wordless groans. We can't even get the words out. The Spirit says, oh, I know what they want. I know what they want. I know what they're asking for. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things. God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Family, when it's all said and done, even the crosses, we will say, for God's glory, even the furnaces, the giants, the walls, we'll be able to say, Lord, I get that sin is unreasonable, but I'm so glad you've given me a reason to get through it all. May you be glorified. May what I'm going through be a 
inspiration for others. What I'm going through, may it glorify you. May what I'm going through tell the devil to his face that you're my friend and nothing will separate me from your love, not even death. As believers like that family, if God is for us, who can stand against? Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is only temporary. What is unseen is eternal. God bless us. We know one day, as you did with Job, we'll receive more than a double portion. That one day, because of the sacrifice of your son Jesus, you will more than make it up to us for all the suffering we had to endure. Thank you for being a sufferer as well. So you can empathize with us. You see us. And that's all we were hoping for, is that you see us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.